I wanted to talk uh, today about clinical neuropsychology and what that entails and give kind of an introduction to what what I do and, and what our department does. Um, so when I started grad school, I did not know a lot about neuropsychology. I knew very little, actually. I knew that it existed, but not much beyond that. And so <clears throat> I think it's important to, to discuss that and get a better understanding. And these are the bobs. I'm sure everyone knows the bobs. What would you say you do here? OK. So uh, to, j just to start, what is the role of a neuropsychology? And perhaps I should start with, what is neuropsychology in general? So uh, neuropsychology is a specialty within psychology itself, or so like a subdivision or a subspecialty, whatever you want to call it. And its focus is on uh, brain and behavior rate relationships. And it's a very kind of broad definition. but um, And it's evolved over the years. So there are different approaches to neuropsychological assessment, but largely we're looking at brain functioning and how that translates to uh, you know, everyday real world functioning from a cognitive, neurocognitive perspective. So if there's a brain injury, what has that done to that person's uh, cognitive abilities and how does that translate to um, how it impacts them in everyday life in terms of what they can or cannot do. Um, and the, the role of a neuropsychologist, like I said, is to assess those brain and behavior relationships um, but there are different uh, areas that neuropsychologists can, can practice in, and it's quite varied. Um, uh, many choose to practice in research settings or medical legal settings, uh, in which neuropsychology is quite popular. Um, and of course, there's the clinical side. And most of the professionals that I've worked with in my time have been either from a research side or a clinical side. Um, and most of them, if not all of them, uh, spend a considerable amount of their day-to-day you know, -day work um, assessing patients. Um, and so like I mentioned, there's some niche consultation roles as well. But the overarching goal of a, a neuropsychologist in, 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 from a clinical perspective and what they're trying to do is objectively evaluate those cognitive functions. So you'll have patients that come in and you know they'll talk about their subjective symptoms, so memory loss, or I'm having difficulty concentrating, or I can't, uh, there's words that I can't get out. And so those are, are subjective symptoms and experiences, and we want to quantify them to the degree that we can. And in that process, we look at different areas of functioning. So some of those could be attention, uh, speech, language, complex, receptive, and expressive language, uh, learning and memory, other executive processes, planning, organization, logic, and abstraction, visual, uh, visual perceptual abilities, um, sensory motor functioning to a certain degree. Not all neuropsychologists assess that heavily. And then, of course, uh, emotional behavioral personality processes, which is an important, uh, an important part uh, in a comprehensive neuropsychological assessment. And it's part of what you know, defines the assessment to a certain degree, and we'll talk about that later. Um, oh, just to go back here, and in terms of how neuropsychology has evolved over the years, um, and what it looks like today. It, it kind of depends who you talk to and when you talk to them and what setting they work in. But um, back in the, uh, the 30s and the 40s, um, there was an approach called the, uh, the halstead Ritan Neuropsychological Assessment Process or Battery. And this was developed in a way that looked at the localization of function. So we wanted to find out where in the brain is their pathology and how is that affecting the person localization, lateralization of brain dysfunction or pathology. And that was a very standardized battery. It's still widely used today. Uh, it's popular in Michigan. At least that's my impression of it. Um, and again, you're focused on the, that localization and lateralization. Now, you know, after that, closer, I believe, the 60s and 70s, um, we, or the, the, the profession developed, there were other things developing the pref profession. We have the for example, the uh, the Luria and Nebraska assessment battery, and that was focused on a qualitative, a more qualitative assessment of, of functional um, strengths and deficits. So there was an emphasis placed on what do those deficits look like, you know, in, in an everyday setting. Um, but they still also looked at lateralization and localization as well. And then today there are, there are other varied processes, but um, much of what I run into today is 
these close assessments of functional or neurocognitive strengths and weaknesses. We want to know where the person excels cognitively and where they might uh, struggle. And that way we can inform uh, treatment planning and, and, and in certain ways we can also help narrow down um, or provide diagnostic clarity. So it's changed over the years. You'll still find plenty of, of, of practitioners who work from a Halstead approach or a, a Lurie Nebraskan approach and that's fine. Um, it kind of depends on your training and, and your, your mentors and how you were brought up in the profession. But um, there's a lot of different ways to approach it, which I think is good. Um, in terms of patient populations, so who we see, again, uh, the types of people we see are, are, can be quite varied. Uh, these are some common uh, referral, um, uh, forgetting the word here, <coughs> referral conditions. Yeah, I have, to have it right there. Uh, so traumatic brain injury, of course. <laughs> yeah, word finding difficulties right there. We'll talk about that. Um, seizure disorders, when I worked in Dearborn, uh, we had uh, a lot of referrals for, um, for uh, epileptic disorders, epilepsy. Uh, neurodegenerative disorders, we're talking Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease, movement disorders. And then other forms of dementia, of which there are several, including la vascular and Lewy body. Um, Another one is abrupt changes in cognitive functioning, and that uh, will you get referrals uh, with some regularity. Someone will say, um, or "Suddenly, I had these word finding difficulties. I couldn't uh, express what I wanted to say." Um, toxic chemical exposure, neurodevelopmental disorders, um, and and to a degree, some idiopathic presentations. So, you know, uh, memory loss with an unknown cause or an unclear cause, or um, concentration problems, things of that nature. And so the patient population can be quite diverse. Um, here at Insight, we're looking to uh, expand to uh, pediatric services as well. So working with kids, and that was a big part of my internship training was pediatric uh, psychology, neuropsychology. So the, the assessment process, um, it's a, it's a three-step process at its core. And uh, it involves quite a bit. And so, you know, part of what I would think is a good assessment process is prepping the patient so that they understand uh, what's going on and they're oriented to what the procedure involves. That's very important, especially in such a lengthy process. So the first part starts with the clinical interview and what we call a neurobehavioral status exam. And, and this is, uh, depending on who you talk to, perhaps the most important part of the assessment itself. We're gathering information about the person, their social history, um, the history and evolution of their presenting problem. And from a neurobehavioral perspective, we are doing a clinical evaluation of certain functions, language, memory, visuospatial processing. And these are kind of cursory investigations into these abilities and functions so that we can determine how we're going to approach this from a, an evaluative standpoint. Um, I uh, was reading recently, there's a, a, a forum where uh, you know, psychologists, neuropsychologists will get together and talk about certain issues. And one person specifically, specifically mentioned that the assessment portion uh, is perhaps their weakest area in terms of information. They rely a lot on their interview, uh, their social history gathering, and their knowledge of uh, neural structures and pathology. So that's important. Um, we identify the focus areas. Where do we want to focus our assessment? It's a lengthy process. Uh, we want to know where we should be paying attention to the most. Uh, I mentioned the emotional personality function functioning, which is important. Um, I've encountered uh, quite a few times uh, where people will, their presenting problems or concerns are memory impairments or concentration, attention deficits, and it's very concerning and distressing for them. So of course you want to get a better understanding of that. Um, but one of the things that comes out in the interview or through the course of testing is there's also uh, a very prominent underlying anxiety disorder or depressive disorder. And certain disorders, both physiological and emotional, uh, or we call symptom mimics, so they'll have uh, aspects of the disorder that mimic other disorders, you know, neurological disorders. And so it's important to kind of tease that out so you can, you can identify a source if possible, of the presenting condition. Um, we're looking for, of course, that quantitative, objective, measured data. Um, and when we do that, 
we measure a person's performance relative to other person, other persons who are demographically similar. So uh, good tests will have a, a good normative base, which means that there is a group of people they, de they deem to be, well, in certain cases, normal uh, with regards to their functioning, and they assess them, and then we compare our numbers to those numbers to see if there's a deviation from that. Um, and then, of course, we want to focus on that qualitative data, uh, understanding from just an interpersonal perspective how this person presents, and in that way, uh, what other things might be underlying that their presenting condition. And uh, at a conference recently, I spoke to another uh, uh, psychologist who mentioned, uh, so it's very common to have a psychometrist uh, working with a neuropsychologist. A psychometrist is a person who um, is trained in the administration and scoring of certain uh, uh, psychological and neuropsychological tests. So they will do those tests um, for the neuropsychologist who then interpret it. And this uh, professional I spoke to says that uh, she never uses a psychometrist because she misses out on that interpersonal interaction with the person, and that's so valuable to her. Um, and so she doesn't use those, those kinds of services. But that's, a, that's kind of an individual preference. Um, after evaluation, the neuropsychologist will spend time integrating that data together. That is the crux of what the assessment is about. It's about taking those bits of data that are individual, so the social history, the genetic history, medical history, um, environmental present or environmental history, uh, neurodevelopmental processes, and the, your test data, integrating that together, and then uh, forming conclusions and diagnostic impressions based on that data cohesively together. Um, and I mentioned the normative comparisons. From there, uh, their, your final appointment is meeting with the patient and potentially that patient's family or other providers or uh, support people and discussing what those results say. And sometimes those go very well and sometimes those are difficult um, in terms of discussions and, and revealing certain things, but um, it's also an extremely important part of the process. It's the end product, really. Um, and so how are assessment results used? Again, we mentioned diagnostic clarity, especially for those idiopathic presentations where we don't really know the source of what's going on. Um, determining if we're looking at a psychological or psychogenic uh, disturbance as opposed to a neurocognitive uh, source for difficulties. Like I said, depression and anxiety and other sorts of um, emotional disorders of that nature can have symptoms that look like other things. Uh, of course, we're identifying areas of strength and areas, I don't like to say weakness, but areas of uh, less well-developed ability or impacted ability. Um, and there is evidence to suggest that focusing on strengths can be helpful, especially um, when you're looking at you know, profound impairment. And functional ability, in many cases, we want to know what the person can do, and we use that as a jumping off point in treatment. And for some individuals, we're looking to establish baseline data. Um, and this happens a lot when, well, I shouldn't say that. It, it happens in many cases. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is, is a person that comes in who's in their mid-50s, and they're saying, I have some memory problems. These are new problems. And uh, I want to know what that's all about. And uh, with Alzheimer's, specifically, you're looking at, it's commonly diagnosed in your, your, your you know, mid to later 60s. That's a common area where memory problems will start to emerge. Um, and so, you know, in some cases you're looking for to establish a baseline. What does that person look like now? And assessment in a year or two years, what does that person look like down the road? And that'll give us some information about, um, you know, the course of their symptoms and whether that suggests a neurodegenerative disorder or something else. Uh, treatment effectiveness, we're also looking potentially at how effective are these this person's treatments? So let's say they're in a neuro rehab program. Uh, you know, what's working for this person? Are we noticing uh, improvements in their speech language functioning? But well, we can assess that from our um, from certain aspects of a battery. So it'll help us decide: Hey, is this is working, or do we need to adjust what we're doing with this person? And then, of course, uh, from an initial standpoint, treatment planning. You know, what should we do to address this person's concerns uh, in their neurocognitive uh, from their neurocognitive perspective? Uh, and then future directions, um, you know, these days there's, I get the sense that there's 
a little bit of anxiety with regard to the intersection of neuropsychology and, and imaging. So imaging is amazing, and it can provide a lot of information that in years past was inaccessible. And, you know, there's, there's whispers in the crowd of what does that mean for neuropsychology? Is it going to disappear? Or can we just send someone through, you know, uh, an imaging device, get our information, and move on? Do we need these lengthy assessments? Uh, and I think the answer is not so simple as saying yes or no, but um, identifying neuropsych the role of neuropsychology and where that fits in uh, with other professions. You know, I think largely you're looking at the best outcomes when you have a good integrated team approach. So you have a number of different professionals working um, together to come up with uh, solutions to problems. And I think that's how the, the field's going to move forward. Um, and I have a great ho uh, quote here that was, that was uh, very hopeful and uh, inspiring. Um, in neuroscience generally and cognitive neuroscience in particular is increasingly a multidisciplinary team effort. And the focus and emphasis by governments and funding agencies for translational approaches to understanding health and disease will require a sustained investment in understanding brain and behavior relationships at the human level. Increasing collaboration and interaction between neuroimaging and neuropsychological approaches in cognitive neuroscience will provide confidence in the conclusions derived from imaging studies, as well as increasing the power and impact of patient observations. In the current area of crisis with regards to replication and validity of scientific findings, um, the need for converging lines of evidence using multiple methods is needed more urgently than ever. And I think that really says it all. Um, it speaks to that team approach as well as the need to, um, to validate what we have. So there are many times where I'll get imaging reports back and they'll say, um, you know, no midline shift, no evidence of infarct, um, generally unremarkable, age appropriate, cortical atrophy, you know, and that'll be it. But then you'll have a person saying, I understand that it says it's essentially normal. But these are the things that I'm experiencing, and they impact my life. And so you still you have to answer that question. You can't say, "Well, your MRI is fine. There's nothing to worry about." You know, and so that's where I think neuropsychology and other professions come in is is saying your symptoms from a, a subjective standpoint are very real, and and where what is causing that? It's unsatisfying for a patient to say that your MRI is fine. Go home. There's no evidence of any problem, which I don't think actually happens. You know. <coughs> Um, and then a future directions, again, you know, biomarkers, looking for biomarkers to help substantiate or identify disorders. Um, there are a lot of disorders right now, ones that are very prevalent in our society that don't have a biomarker identified. So we, we, we have to rely on other, perhaps less precise measures of, of identifying them. And so I think the goal in some areas of science is to identify those so we can say, yep, not only from a clinical perspective do you show signs of that, but also from a physiological, um, uh, biological, genetic perspective, you have that as well. So we can uh, provide more accuracy. Localization versus connection. I kind of touched on this before. It's kind of an ongoing discussion in neuropsychology and neurology about um, what does function in the brain look like and what does pathology in the brain look like. So, you know, back in the 30s and 40s when the Halstead uh, battery was developed, we were looking at identifying localization of, of pathology and lateralization of pathology. Um, I think increasingly we're, we're, we're taking a view of the brain as perhaps less of a localized structure and more of a, a diffuse kind of connected structure in which there are multiple areas that work in tandem to, to produce a behavior or a result. And that's not necessarily, it wasn't necessarily discarded early on when, when localization was, was very popular, but I think there's an increased focus on that connective perspective. Um, and then assessment standardization. Again, I went to a conference recently, or within the last year, where um, we were, there, the discussion was broached about um, what are some standards in terms of assessment within the profession. I have a book called uh, The Compendium, Compendium of Neuropsychological Tests. It's very thick, and it has hundreds of different ways of measuring any number of things. And, you know, the question is, is, are those directly comparable? Can you do that all the time? Sometimes you can, but I think the answer is more up in the air in, in other circumstances. So um, 
is standardization something the profession to move, should move towards? Is that something worth uh, research and investing time and effort and money into? I think that's an ongoing discussion. Um, and then personal research interests, uh, you know, we were, I was asked to maybe identify some of these, and I have a number of in personal interests, but um, dementia disorders are something I'm very much interested in uh, and from a clinical perspective, um, and specifically clinical interventions versus pharmacological interventions. So there are uh, a handful of medications out there that can be prescribed for uh, memory changes and cognitive changes associated with neurodegenerative dis disorders. And a lot of those are essentially palliative care. They're not meant to cure. They're not meant to really improve <coughs> functioning. And they don't. I, I don't know if, if people are aware of the... Uh, I can't remember what, uh, what research group it was, but they kind of divested themselves from Alzheimer's research. It wasn't cost-effective. They had... It wasn't working for them, so they just kind of up and exited the game. And so, you know, it's a frustrating area, a research area. And so, you know, I'm interested in, in how, and in, in that development in terms of research and also in clinical interventions, uh, specifically novel treatments and approaches for these memory and cognitive impairments that we're seeing for neurodegenerative illnesses. Um, and most importantly, I'm looking at or I'm interested in increasing quality of life for people throughout that disease process. So a big question that people have is, okay, I've been diagnosed with this. What do I do now? And that is perhaps the most important question. What do we do now? It's also a difficult be question because there is no cure for, say, for instance, Alzheimer's. Um, there's limited things that, that you can do, important things, absolutely. But from a, from a, a curative standpoint, there's... You know, we're not there yet. Um, there are some things that exist which increase quality of life, improve that. Um, one of those being reminiscence therapy where you're, you're talking about memories, you're accessing emotions, um, and you're kind of ex exposing the person to those kinds of, of uh, emotional experiences and in, and in that way improving uh, their capacity for interaction and their quality of life. I don't know if people are familiar with uh, Glenertown Square. So Glenertown Square is, is what you call a, a, quote, dementia village in which they've structured uh, the treatment facility uh, in a way that is, um, that caters to certain things. So this is, these are some pictures of, of Glenertown Square. And there, you can see that it's modeled after, they kind of went with a 50s, 60s kind of uh, motif. And it was done in, in a way that provides comfort to the people that live in that facility and, and, and indeed a, a degree of familiarity. Um, you're not looking at sterile white walls and, and you know consistently patterned carpet and things like that. You're looking at things that are hopefully familiar to the person and that offer that degree of comfort and as a result increased quality of life. And at the end of the day, uh, you're, you're looking at helping the person be happier. Um, and so I think that's really important. It's also a very novel approach to this, um, which I think is great. And I think that we should be encouraging those kinds of um, daring thinking when it comes to treating patients. Uh, there are some limitations to this, for example. It is, as you can probably guess, uh, very expensive. And it's cost prohibitive to, a, I would say, the majority of patients, which is unfortunate. And there's not an easy solution to that. And I think that exists wherever you go. I think the first model for this kind of treatment approach was in the Netherlands. Um, but again, very cost prohibitive. And it's easy to see why. I mean, just look at these pictures. So, um, and that's, that's part of that ongoing discussion about how we, how we address those kinds of problems. Because truly, something like Alzheimer's or any other form of dementia, it's not an individual problem. It's also a family, a, a family concern. It's a financial concern. It's a societal concern, uh, a concern on so many levels. And all those levels need to be addressed in order to address that, the, the overall issue appropriately. So um, you know, going forward, in the absence of pharmacological breakthroughs, this is where, uh, you know, this, these are the front lines here. So important areas to focus on, 
and um, and to remember. You know, I don't remember seeing uh, a lot of media hype about you know Glenner Town Square, but you see a lot of media hype about potential breakthroughs for this disease and that. So you know, balance is what I advocate for. But uh, that is it. I hope that provided some insight into uh, the role of the clinical neuropsychologist and what we do. Well, thank, thank you, everybody. You very much.